this is inspiration for so people who, who've been living under a rock for the last few weeks or months may not have heard about this but this is the first civilian crew to orbit the earth now um what's remarkable about that is that this you know entrepreneurial um inspiration for shift for payment ceo guy called jared uh, isaacman he basically funded the whole mission now it was interesting today listening to the united nations secretary general talking about you know billionaires in space and how disgusting that is you know branson and bezos you know billionaires going up on little joy rides into space when there's millions of people starving around the world and you could say, well, again, this is just another space jolly, but it isn't. It really did a lot of good. The, the whole aim of this was not only to inspire people, uh, hence the name and the mission, but also to raise vast amounts of money for uh, childhood cancer research at St. Jude's in America. And I mean, St. Jude's Hospital is aiming to raise about 200 million. I think you know they're well on the way with that now because of this mission. Um, so Jared Isaac Money basically uh, bought up four seats, took one himself, let three go to other people. One of the people, uh, Sean Proctor, somebody I know quite well, um, fantastic lady, done some amazing outreach and obviously hopefully will continue to do outreach as well. Uh, Hayley Arkansas, hopefully I pronounced her name correctly, she's a physician assistant who worked at St. Jude's. Uh, she had bone cancer herself, so it really is quite an inspirational mission, I think. And you know, there were so many people went for this. It shows you that the interest in space is, is huge. There were 72,000 people applied for this mission. Uh, from all over the place and it was kind of a bit of a lottery a bit of a down selection and then you know looking at what these people could deliver as it were now if you think about this putting a civilian crew up into space there was a lot of debate on various web forums facebook forums like space hipsters and other forums saying well they're not astronauts well they are astronauts i think in this case they are and i'll kind of hopefully justify this now you look at what happened with Bezos and Virgin Galactic? Now, the people who flew on those missions, now, whether or not you say they crossed the common line or not, as to them qualifying for their, their astronaut wings, that's a whole other debate. We'll leave that one aside. They were passengers in a spacecraft, and they did practically nothing in that spacecraft bar, basically provide themselves as test articles. It was almost like the early days of the Mercury astronauts, where they were nicknamed Spam in a Can, as Terry said uh, just before we went on air. Now, it's true, you'd watch the movie The Right Stuff, and that's how they saw themselves. These guys were extremely accomplished test pilots, uh, the Mercury 7, as were all of the Apollo astronauts, and they trained for months, years, um, you know, to to do what they did, even though in some cases, the early Mercury flights in particular, it was pretty much autonomous. It was just up and down um, until it went into orbit, obviously, and the likes of John Glenn, et cetera. Um, now with Bezos and Virgin Galactic, as I said, if I get on a plane, I'm not the pilot. I'm a passenger. I'm not a pilot. I am a passenger on an aircraft. So if I sit in a capsule and I'm shot up and I, you know, go around the Earth once or come back down straight on a suborbital, I'm still a passenger. I may have gone into space, but I'm still a passenger. So maybe there needs to be a term like astronauts or whatever to qualify what these people do. With this mission, they were trained. They were trained for months. They were trained in orbital dynamics. They were trained in emergency escape procedures, emergency flight procedures, takeover procedures in case anything went wrong. Uh, Isaacman himself is a qualified jet pilot. So these are not people who were just up for a jolly. They orbited the Earth. It's the first time a civilian crew's been up you know, from US soil since STS-2 uh, with Joe Engel, who was an X-15 pilot. Uh, he's still the only surviving uh, member of the X-15 test pilot crew, an amazing guy. And he flew the space shuttle with um, Truly uh, on STS-2 just after Crippen and Young had done STS-1. And again, that was you know, complete risk. But the first rookie crew, as it were, the first kind of not been into space before crew that, you know, that's been off US soil since 1981, 82. Um, some of the, I think Shenzhou 7 in 2008 was the last time the Chinese did it with an all-rookie crew. Um, but it was it was quite a risk. I mean, you say space is easy, and SpaceX tend to make things look very easy. Uh, now, the launches, the cadence, the uh, you know, frequency of the launches is so quick. The turnaround is so quick, and they're aiming to make that even faster with the likes of you know Super Heavy, etc. But it's so fast now and they've become so reliable apart from obviously some of the testing that they're still doing where things are still blowing up but with the falcon series it is incredibly reliable um 
but it's not easy. Things can still go wrong. You know, you only have to watch The Martian, the movie, to see what happens when a Falcon does go wrong. That was real footage of a Falcon disintegrating with uh, some really nice food on it, apparently, as well. And a, a, a British chef called Heston Blumenthal have prepared. Uh, but we won't go into that. But it can still go wrong. So these people are still putting their lives on the line. And to go through all of that training, I think they do actually qualify as astronauts in this case. I don't know what you think, Terry, but that's kind of my justification for this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the missions now, as we're saying, uh, up to the ISS are almost entirely automated. But you wouldn't say that the guys that are going up uh, to dock with the ISS are not astronauts. Even though the computer is doing most of it, if things go wrong, they have the training and the ability to do everything manually. Um, the same applied to this crew. Uh, fortunately, they didn't need to, uh, to do that. Everything worked. Although apparently there was a bit of a problem with the toilet, which is everybody's favorite <laughs> subject, <laughs> subject <laughs> about uh, what do you do in space. Apparently there was a bit of a problem with the, the suction for the, the toilet device, but they got it sorted. The right stuff, they could even fix toilets, never mind anything else. Well, let's be honest, it's the only question they're <laughs> going to be asked for the next 20 years. Probably. <laughs> uh, what I found fascinating was that they went so high up, much higher than the ISS, higher even yeah. than the Hubble Space Telescope. They were up at a height of 585 kilometers, 363 miles. The interesting thing about that is if their retro rocket had failed to fire, they were stuck there. They couldn't even dock with the ISS and stay there for a while uh, until something was sorted out. The only thing that could go and get them would basically have been another Falcon rocket. And I yeah. They had two already in space, so I don't know if they had yet another one. So it was a, a bit of a risk doing that. Uh, but it also meant basically that they were getting a fantastic view of the Earth. When you're on the ISS, you see sort of a almost like flying in a very high aeroplane, except higher, basically. But you cannot see the whole of the Earth because you're not high enough up above it. They were far enough up not to be able to see the whole Earth, but definitely to see it as a sphere. So, sorry, flat earthers. These are not uh, NASA or ESA or whoever uh, paid people keeping quiet about the fact that the Earth is flat. These are civilians. If you get a chance to ask them, they will tell you it definitely is round. Also meant they were coming in at a, quite a high re-entry speed, yeah. which uh, would have been quite spectacular. You don't want to think about what happens if the parachute doesn't open. As you were saying, you know, sometimes it makes it, it uh, look easy but there are things that can go wrong and when they go wrong in space they go very wrong but I think it was a fantastic achievement and uh, very well done once again Elon Musk love him hate him this was a good one it, it was and as you said you know the apogee and perigee the the altitude that they got to I mean EM1 that um, test mission that was flown on a delta on a delta heavy a few years back uh, which was the first time I think in my lifetime I'd seen anything like an Apollo capsule splash down in the ocean. And that was an uncrewed flight. But again, the onboard cameras on that were showing, you know, what was possible when you're talking about those kind of altitudes. They didn't quite get up to that altitude. But as you said, the, the entry velocity, this was this was risky in so mm -hmm. many respects. You know, as you said, if the parachutes fell, and you look, we, we're going to be talking about the Chinese mission in a while. You know, the parachutes on the early Mercury flights and some of these later Chinese flights as well, they only have one parachute. They'll probably have a backup or reserve. But you look at the Apollo spacecraft, on Apollo 15 in particular, uh, when that was coming back in, one of the parachutes failed. And they had built this system redundancy in that if one of the chutes failed, they would still splash down at a safe velocity. But... If you, if you look at, you know, one parachute failing, that can be really catastrophic. Even if you've got two parachutes and one fails, again, it can be quite catastrophic. And it depends if you're landing on the ocean, if, you, if you're on land. And even with Bezos and his last minute, and the Soyuz, obviously, with his last minute firing of retro boosters just before it hits the ground, which makes it look like it's kind of puffing up a, a big cloud of smoke. But it is literally just to decelerate it quite rapidly at the, at the last split second. Um Things like that go wrong, and you're going from a, a really nice kind of gentle touchdown to being in a car crash, in effect. Mm -hmm. So it's, it took a lot of guts, and I think for people who had no formal astronaut training to go from being selected, you know, just a short while ago, six months plus ago, to flying on a mission that the altitude, as you said, had never been achieved by a crewed mission in, you know, since the Gemini era or the Apollo era in particular. Uh, took some gut, I think. Mm -hmm. So, definite hat tip. And as you said, love or hate him, 
yeah, he pulled off a good. It was a good one. This and it raised a truckload of money. So yeah, um, for for a very good cause. So he personally yeah. gave fifty million. Apparently, Elon Musk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you know, small change to him, but still, it's a big amount for a hospital. Small change to him, but then at least he's not trying to sue NASA and sue everyone else like uh, yeah. the richest man alive is trying to do right now. But anyway. <laughs>